Hello, Somos. Welcome Hello. to Summer Somos Fun Club, the second meeting. I'm Martina. I'm Alicia. And we are super excited this summer to be um, connecting teachers that are thinking about using SOMOS, that have used SOMOS, that are definitely using SOMOS um, with some training so that you feel really equipped and ready to jump into the coming year. So today, um, Alicia and I are going to be talking about um, unit structure and basically what do you find when you um, open up a SOMOS unit, like you download it from Teachers Pay Teachers, you open it up, what are you looking at? And then also, um, once you open up the files, um, what does the, what's the structure of the unit? How do you, um, what does a typical unit look like? Um, just to help you um, feel like you're familiarized with it before the year, um, the year launches. So you get SOMOS, you open up a unit file. When you download it from Teachers Pay Teachers, you download it. Um, if you don't purchase a single unit, you get a zip file. If you purchase the whole curriculum bundle, you also get a zip file. Um, if it's the whole curriculum, you've got to unzip the file and you'll see a bunch of folders. Um, and then even if you purchase a single, um, single unit, you'll see a folder. And in each unit folder, you will always find a PDF that has the lesson plans. And that has to be a PDF because of a lot of the formatting stuff um, that I do on my end. So unfortunately, it's not editable. Sometime, most of the time, I'm able to leave it unlocked so that if you have a PDF editing software, you can kind of go in and make little changes to it, like maybe change wording. Um, like uh, I use PDF Expert for um, some of my editing, but sometimes I do have to lock the PDFs because of different things like clip art and stuff that's in them. So sometimes you can't do that. Um, so you'll find the lesson plans PDF. You'll get a slideshow. Um, the slideshow is provided in PowerPoint format and PDF format. This, the PowerPoint format is slides compatible. So that means if you open it up in Google Slides, um, all of the fonts in it are um, Google fonts. And so it should um, translate very well over to that. Um, and then you can save it in your own personal Google Drive. Um, that is a new thing that I've been doing over the last couple of years. So there are a few straggler units that aren't compatible yet, but they will be done by the end of the summer. We're almost done with that project. Um, so you'll get a slideshow PowerPoint, which you can open in Google Slides, and then the PDF. And then you'll get a unit owner overview, which we'll look at in a little bit. You'll get a terms of use file. And then sometimes there are other files in there. But the big thing is, as soon as you open up the, um, the folder, go straight to the lesson plans PDF. And the lesson plans PDF will walk you through how to use all of the other files that are in that folder. Do you have any comments about that, Alicia? Nope. That's just don't forget the lesson plans. They're really yes. important. <laughs> yes. Open up the lesson plans. So the in the lesson plans PDF, you're typically going to find um, suggested daily lesson plans. We'll talk about that in a minute. You're going to find resources for introducing the core vocabulary, which um, if you were, were in last week's mindset, if you watched our mindset, Summer Summer Fun Club, um, that I talked about how I'm not calling it target vocabulary um, in order to just clear up some confusion. We're calling it core vocabulary. Um, and so for that, you'll find some sentences for students to translate. You'll find PQA questions. Um, in every unit, there's a song with some activities that you can do with the song. There's always a TPRS story script, suggestions for activities to do with the stories. There's a cultural connection, extension activities for the culture. There's always an interpretive assessment. And then in most units, there is at least a listening or a writing assessment, if not both. So all of those things are going to be in the lesson plans PDF. So that is why we say, like, open that PDF you read through the lesson plans, which is, are the first set of pages, and then all of the other resources will be referenced by page number um, in those daily lesson plans. And um, you might notice that we're not going to talk about assessments at all. We're going to talk about those next week. So if you don't mind saving your questions, I can talk about assessment forever and ever and ever. And so I'll be here <laughs> next week to talk to you about assessment because I love forever. talking about assessment. <laughs> really next week it'll be starting it'll be starting july 2nd at 1 p.m and going until midnight <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> kidding but seriously um okay so the first most important thing is 
oh, if that like froze in the thing. Always read the lesson plans before you start the unit. So the lesson plans, I mean, maybe you're totally like a, on the fly, whatever person, and you feel like you can read them, you know, as you're going through the day. But please, please take some time, carve it out before you start the unit, read through all of the lesson plans, think through what things are going to work for you, what things aren't going to work for you, um, you know, what are the unique challenges you have, look through all of the song lyrics, make sure you're not going to get fired because there's any song lyrics that I didn't think seemed very questionable, but maybe in your context, they would be questionable, um, you know, any of the questions, um, the, the personalized questions, like read through everything and think through with from the lens of, you know, what can I do in my class and what do I want to do with my class? Um, and just if you're, if you come away from this and you want to know more about like what it looks like to actually sit down and open up the lesson plan and like figure out what to do with students. I wrote a really long blog post and I'm happy to post that of like this specific, this is the first thing that I do. These are the questions that I ask myself. So it's really, really laid out in terms of how I use what my context is to use the lesson plans. And I'm happy to post that if y'all are interested. Yes, please do. I, I feel like it is so mm -hmm. helpful to just kind of get into someone's brain who has been using this and like, not just, you know, how do I decode the lesson plans, but you know, how do I approach them? Like what's happening in my head as I'm looking at them? What things am I looking for? Um, what considerations do I have? So definitely um, share that post. And then um, I would recommend everybody um, as a follow up homework activity um, for this summer, summer, summer club, um, to, to read that, uh, to read that post. So do you want to talk about this one, Alicia? Yeah. So um, I think that a lot of teachers, they look at the lesson plans and they think, okay, day one, these are the things I have to do on day one, because it says lesson plans for day one. <laughs> so it's a reasonable assumption, but I really want to encourage you that they are suggestions. If something doesn't work for you, if you don't feel comfortable doing an activity, if it's not interesting to you or your students, it's a suggestion. Um, there is some value in not doing something from day seven before you do days one, two, three, four, five, six activities because they do build on each other. However, it makes a ton of sense to take the things from day one, the little pieces from day one and do the ones that you want. And if it takes you three days, it usually takes me two or three days at least. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and then maybe I don't do everything that are on the day two plans. I jump right into the story or I can never fit a song in on the first day ever, ever, ever. <laughs> in in my style, in my context, it doesn't work like that. So, um, oh, and here's my cat. Um, <laughs> Martina, can you pull up? This is Diego, Hello, gotcha. he missed me. Um, he, uh, can you pull up the unit overview? Do you want to do that now? Oh, that's uh, a, yes, I can do that. That other piece. So, so well, this is the, that the question is, this is Martina's it. big, big super challenge. Okay. So okay, here we go. I took the unit overview and I did kind of a side by side comparison. We'll see if it'll pull up of. So this is the so, unit overview. This file is included in almost every unit. By the end of the summer, this will be included in every unit. And there is now one for unit eight of New Som. Yes. Right? And there will be for other French units as well. Yes. It's, oui. a re it's a great, great resource, especially if you need to find your essential questions and post your, uh, post your daily uh, student learning objectives and that, that sort of thing. But if you scroll down... Um, you'll see kind of a, <laughs> a day by okay. day, day one lesson activities, and it's broken down for you very easily. It's a really nice resource. So it's up in, I'm so dyslexic. It's the first column after day one. Um, however, this one, right can here. You, yep. Can you pull up the other document? The lesson plans Maybe? document? The, yeah, the lesson okay. plans. Yeah, so we can compare. Mm -hmm. So let's show you like how do things look differently in the lesson plans document versus the um, the unit overview. So the lesson plans document is very detailed. 
It's more like a narrative than a list. Yeah, I can. Is it, does it work if I have them both up? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So here you can see like the campanada gives you links. It tells you exactly what the campanada is. Um, it tells you all these instructions for introducing the vocabulary. It tells you exactly what to do with the song. It explains it all. Whereas over here, it's just bulleted. Mm -hmm. Which is really useful. However, when I sit down and I look, and for me, I do, I'd say 95% of what is in every unit for the units that I teach. However, I remove these day markers and I think of it more as a bulleted list of mm. these are all of the things that I'm going to do. So for the first day, I'm gonna introduce the core vocabulary. I'm gonna do some PQA, which stands for personalized question and answers. I'm going to um, do the translation activity and then I never have time to do the song. So then the <laughs> day two, like the second day I see that group, I'm gonna do the song. Sometimes there's another activity um, and then I'm gonna go ahead and start story asking. I like to spend time on stories. So that might take me all of day three and then day four, I do an activity with the story. So now I'm like two to four days behind what the lesson plans say. And that's okay because I'm teaching kids, not curriculum. Because you um, can go your own way. Away. It's, <laughs> because it's my classroom and this is just my guide. So I really want to encourage you guys to use it as a guide, not a stricture. Thank you. I think that, I think that is so important and, and we just cannot uh, stress that enough because I think so much um, uh, stress, uh, like when we, when we encounter teachers that are using SOMOS that are just like, Oh, they're feeling frantic. It's because they've gotten behind, but you can't get behind. Um, you know, you the the lesson plans. I'll pull this up again. Um, the lesson plans are suggestions, and so you are free to use them however you want to use them. And I do recommend you know following in sequence, but you can skip pieces. You can also um, you know a lot of teachers. Uh, one the, one of the reasons that people find so much so helpful is because it's going to walk you through all of these different things that you can do. And so it's helpful to like kind of learn new activities, um, learn new approaches. However, um, if you're feeling uh, kind of overwhelmed because you just tried a new activity yesterday and you haven't had a chance to even let that marinate, um, you don't have to try another new activity. You can do the same, um, you know, in each unit, uh, there's two or three activities that you can do with the story, the class story. And if you want to just do the same three activities, several units in a row so that you can get comfortable with them, your students can get comfortable with them, you can do that. Um, you know, I wrote them out in the unit so that they're different, so that there's novelty built in. But if you don't want novelty, if you want familiarity um, to, build, um, to build that confidence, um, that's great. And I would add to that, if the idea of story asking in three different sections exha exhausts you and you don't feel like you can manage it, I don't feel like I can manage it like three hours in a row. It, that is um, one of the harder pieces of this curriculum. Yeah. Definitely the most rewarding, but challenging. It's OK to play with the order of things a bit. So in one class, you story ask. In another class, maybe you do a reading with a story from a different class that uses the same same core vocabulary, and then you flip flop the next day, stuff like that. So you can there is some flexibility um, based on your own energy levels and desires. Yeah, I, I will be talking about story asking um, in one of our. It's either late July or early August sessions. And then the one after that will be alternatives to story asking. Um, but story asking is a, a hard thing. And you'll find like in some classes, it's amazing. And in some classes, it's really hard. And so like what you just said, sometimes like if you have a class that loves story asking, do story asking with them and then use the story that they created um, in your other classes that maybe don't. And like I had um, my afternoon classes, I had, um, 
I had a Spanish one in the morning and then I had a Spanish one like right after lunch. And that class was always very quiet. And so they just didn't ever want to offer interesting suggestions. So they loved just going over the morning's stories. And then my last class of the day was insane, but they loved creating stories, but they were insane. So um, I didn't always have the energy <laughs> to do it with them. <laughs> um, so before we like really get into like the actual structure of the unit, I wanted to walk through um, why it is structured the way that it is. So SOMOS is a comprehension based and culture rich curriculum. And why did we do that? Why did I um, create these, write these units the way that they are? And this is because as you guys are um, in um, uh, self into the units as you're using the, the lesson plans as suggestions as you're going your own way I I really um, want to uh, encourage you to um, find your own way within the framework of comprehension based methods so um, you know, otherwise, it's almost it, it just it becomes something different. So inject your, yourself into it and inject your own ideas, but keep the focus on comprehension. And this is why. So my husband's in real estate. He loves Keller. Well, he's with Keller Williams. So everything that Gary Keller says, we all read it. And in uh, Keller, Gary Keller and Jay Papasan wrote this book called The One Thing. And in the book, they talk about this question. What is the one thing such that by doing it, everything else will become easier or unnecessary? And in every area of your life, there is one thing that if you do that one thing well, that then everything else in that area of your life will become easier or unnecessary. So for with my kids, it is sleep schedules. And right now having um, our three little cousins here, you know, just having an additional four people in the house, um, sleep schedules are totally out of whack and it is stressful for all of us. Um, so it affects, you know, kids' attitudes, it affects the way they interact with each other, it affects everything. Um, so, but if we can do sleep schedules well, everything else is easier or unnecessary. Um, in, te in language teaching, comprehensible input is the one thing. If you can do that one thing well, if you can provide your students with input, reading content, listening content, that they understand, that they can attend to and understand, if you do that one thing well, everything else as a language teacher will be easier or unnecessary. And I have experienced that. I know, Alicia, you also have experienced that. Um, you know, so many management issues are ca caused by students not understanding, by feeling like they're dumb, by feeling lost. And so if you can keep them understanding and you can keep them engaged, if they understand, because you're also um, uh, uh, trying to connect with the students. So if they can understand the connections that you're trying to make with them, um, management issues are going to go away. You don't have to worry about teaching grammar and testing grammar because comprehensible input is going to create that grammar um, in their heads. It's going to build their mental representation of language. So all of these issues that we worry about, these, these obstacles that we have to tackle as teachers, they all greatly diminish when you're doing comprehensible input well. Now, I want to, to jump in and say that it sounds very easy, but if you've tried to do it, there are a lot of challenges in this, which is, um, why we started with mindset, because really yes. starting with that mindset piece, that comprehensible input is the one thing that we're connecting to our kids and that we're trying to create this culture of connection and communication. Um, that doesn't mean that all of your classroom management problems magically go away. They shift, <laughs> certainly, mm -hmm. but yeah. that it starts from the input and that language starts from the input and everything flows from there. And I think that if you if you start with that idea, everything in the curriculum begins to fall into place. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, um, we do. We do have a question ahead. about authentic oh. resources, and we'll uh, we're going to come to that at the end. So, Hannah, I see your question, and we'll come back to it. I promise. Thank okay? you. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page about what comprehensible input is. Input is listening and reading. Comprehensible is understanding 
like really understanding the input. And maybe later today, I'm going to be making a video um, to post um, that walks through that. Um, providing input just beyond where students are right now. So um, uh, you're only slightly pushing students to the next level of, um, of language. And so what that really looks like in SOMOS is we we know more or less, especially when, with Spanish one, you know what words your students know and don't know. And so you can gently introduce new words or new um, structures, uh, like linguistic structures, like new tenses and things that you know they're going to be able to figure out based on what they already, um, what language they already have in their heads. There However, are, sorry, can I jump in? And yes. knowing also that that little push that you give them, you're still making it comprehensible. It's yes. not that they're trying to like understand what you're saying. Those Thank new you. pieces are always comprehensified. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's not like this little trick, like, oh, I'm going to give you this new little piece and see if you can figure out. It's, um, you know, supporting students in this um, as you're giving them just a little bit of new, um, new unfamiliar uh, language. There are so many different forms of comprehensible input, so many different ways that you can teach using comprehensible input. In SOMOS, you're gonna find a lot of different things. Um, and uh, repetition is the key, just repeat, uh, repeated exposure. I should change that to repeated exposure. I know Carol Gobb always talks about that, that um, you, we can't teach something once and expect that students are gonna get it. The idea is that we're using language, we're using the same words over and over and over, we're using the same structures over and over and over as we're um, sharing stories with our students as we're connecting to their lives. And it is that repeated exposure to language that builds their mental representation of language in their heads. Um, input precedes output. So we all want our students to be speaking. Students come into the class because they want to speak the language, but input has to come first. You can't take something out. You can't produce a word that you have never heard. You can't um, say a word that you have never read many times. Um, and so the input has to come first. And that is why the focus in SOMOS is where it is. The input has to come first. Output will follow naturally. Input is indispensable to language acquisition. Language acquisition cannot happen without that. No one disagrees on this, okay? There are, sometimes you'll hear conversations in, um, you know, different professional groups or at conferences about, um, you know, the value of comprehensible input, okay? But no one disagrees that input is indispensable. The, the um, the uh, I would say the conversation maybe happens around, you know, how comprehensible is comprehensible enough and also um, what is the role that output plays. But input, everyone across the board agrees input is indispensable to language acquisition. And so that is why SOMOS is input focused. Language is not built up from practice, but from consistent and constant comprehensible input. So the way um, I like to think about language, the mental representation of language in your head, I think about it like a jungle gym. So, you know, like those half circle uh, things on the playground that have like all the uh, crisscrossy triangle bars between them. They're like those domes. Um, I think about that as what language looks like in your head. And, and Bill Van Patten in his keynote at Comprehensible Online talked about them as um, languages like constellations. So just like that three dimensional kind of thing where there's like um, there's different points and there's connection lines connecting the points. Um, that's what mental what language looks like in your head, where words and pieces of words are connected to other words and pieces of words. So the word Elysia is connected connected to the word Martina, is connected to the word Vermont, because this is where I live, is connected to the word United States, is connected to government, is connected to governed, is connected to governing, is connected to, and you could go on forever. So language is just connections in your head. And that, all of those connections are made through consistent and constant comprehensible input. As you're using, as you're giving your students input, as students are receiving input from other sources, their brains are processing it and they are their brains are building that mental representation in their head. Practice, explicit instruction cannot create that mental representation. The only thing that can create that mental representation 
that can store that language in their heads is input. And this is a big paradigm shift. Yes. <laughs> yes. And then accurate output comes when there are no holes in that mental representation. So when, when students make perhaps a mistake, if you can call them that, um, it's because there's a connection in there that isn't formed yet. So, you know, when you have a student who um, you know, says uh, yo va, it's because, oh, they, that, that connection between the yo and like the irregular um, yo endings, like that connection hasn't been yet. And the only way that that connection can be formed is repeated exposure. It's through input, not and through ex instruction. And exposure that they understand. Yes, thank so you for as, as many of you may have experienced, if you go into the target cult, into the culture where your target language is spoken, but you don't understand anything, it's all just gobbledygook. And that doesn't help, sorry, cat again, um, acquire <laughs> language. It's yeah. just, it only works if the messages are being understood. Mm -hmm. And that's a key point too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, a person can say a word to you 5,000 times, but if you don't understand what that word means, you will not be able to use it. That word can't, it, it's completely useless to you. So that comprehension piece, we cannot lose sight of it. Um, that That is the, 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 the critical piece. And I feel like that's the huge mindset shift that, that comprehension has to happen. Um, instruction does not alter the order of acquisition, neither does practice. I'm not, I'm, I'm going through these slower than I intended to, so I'm just going to skip through it, but I will make a video for you later talking through these a little bit more. Those who read more, write better. It is reading, not instruction, that helps us develop a good writing style. So you want students to be good writers? Great. Read things. And Somos is filled with readings and filled with suggestions and opportunities for further reading. Proficiency develops by listening and understanding and by reading and understanding comprehensible input. That is how proficiency develops. That is where why the focus is in SOMOS where it is. As you guys are going your own way and injecting your own unique self into the curriculum, keep the focus on listening and understanding and reading and understanding. Okay, so it is comprehension based. So here are some of the comprehension based strategies that you will see in SOMOS. You will see collaborative storytelling that could look like TPRS. Um, it could look more like a one word image or um, like a freewheeling um, kind of thing, but just where you're creating stories with your students. Um, movie talk and really modified movie talk is what we use in, in SOMOS or um, what does Lori call it? Video, video chat. chat. Video chat. Um, but that's, uh, you know, a, a slightly adapted version of Dr. Hastings' original movie talk. Um, embedded reading, which was developed by Michelle Whaley and Lori Clark. Picture talk, which is just talking about pictures. Um, TPR, total physical response. I think probably every language teacher has learned about that in their methods class at some point. Personalized questions and answers. Ben Slavic has some great resources about that reading and discussing, and then just straight up storytelling, just telling stories to your students. And sometimes that's uh, just you standing in front of the room talking, and sometimes that's drawing on the board, but just more traditional storytelling where you're not co-creating stories with your classes, you're just telling them a story. Do you have anything to add to that? I don't anything think so. The one thing that isn't up there is card talk, but that is oh, a form yes. of co-creating yes. stories. Yeah. Of collaborative totally. storytelling as well. So that's, I need, I should update that. Okay. So SOMOS has given you comprehensible input. Only you can ensure that it becomes comprehended. So I am um, in, in the lesson plans, all of the readings, there are things that are, should be reasonably able to be understood by a student that has been working through the SOMOS program. Um, you have a whole range of different uh, learners of proficiency levels in front of you. They've come from many different places. Sometimes they've come from other Spanish classes. Um, sometimes, um, you know, they haven't worked through the first SOMOS units. Um, so for all of those reasons, it is your job as the teacher to take what is comprehensible, reasonably able to be understood, and make sure that it is comprehended, that they actually understand what you're hoping that they will understand. Um, a really common question that gets asked on the Facebook group is, do I have to teach the units in order? And um, the answer is 
not necessarily, depending on where what your students know, what they need to know, what you need. Um, however, this piece of making sure the input is comprehended is super important if you're not going sequentially. So if mm -hmm. I skip from unit one to unit five, all of those other words are not necessarily gonna be understandable to my students unless I very intentionally make them comprehended by asking myself, what words have my students not been exposed to? And how do I make sure that they understand this in this context? Mm -hmm. And so absolutely, you can skip around. Um, I encourage you to do what you need to do uh, to, for your teaching context, but keep in mind that it's your, you know, it's it's our job as teachers to make sure that the input is comprehended. Um, we're yeah, lucky so that I, I think. Go on. I was just going to say. So then, I think that there, um, it it puts more work on the teacher to make it comprehended um, in mm -hmm. some when you're jumping around, which you can totally do. Absolutely. Um, Bill has a question. Hi, Bill. <laughs> um, about teaching SOMOS to students who come from non-SOMOS teachers, I'm assuming. Um, so I think that for me, I get students who come in uh, from a comprehension-based curriculum in sixth grade and in seventh grade, and sometimes they don't. Um, and it's my job, again, to make sure that I am making, that I'm using those students' level of comprehension to meet them where they're at, which means that everything I say is comprehended and I'm using all of the strategies that I've learned from, you know, TPRS training. Um, I'm checking the, I'm re teaching to the eyes. I'm asking tons of comprehension questions. I'm linking meaning to L1 also known as translating a word. Um, I'm using props in realia, but making sure it's comprehended to do it. And I think sometimes when you have so students coming in from a class that is not using SOMOS or really, you know, a class that is not comprehension based, it, it really is helpful to, and even when they're new to SOMOS, to take some time and explain to them why we're doing the things that we're doing in the way that we're doing them. So, you know, what do we know about second language acquisition and how does that translate into the choices that we've made for instruction? Um, and I think that's always a good thing to just uh, help your students understand um, why you're doing the things you're doing for buy-in. Um, okay, go ahead. Uh, we had a question from Syl. Can I teach these units without purchasing extra resources like novels? I mostly create my own and want to work with SOMOS as a base, but I don't know if I'm supposed to have other resources. Um, and I would say I taught just SOMOS for a couple of years before I ever felt confident enough to dive into novels. Um, I just added Senor Woolley last year and I'm still playing with it. I, for me, SOMOS has more than enough and all I needed. Um, novels are great, but they're not part of the curriculum necessarily. They're a great thing to add. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I, I would I would agree with that. I think that SOMOS will give you everything that you um, need to get you to, to get you through the year. Um, there are a lot of things that you can do um, and that I strongly advocate for teachers doing um, when they have the confidence to tackle them and if they have the um, the um, resources to be able to acquire them. Um, so, you know, teaching novels was such a um, I just such a joy for me. I, I loved using novels with my classes. Um, we had just great experiences centered around them. Um, when I was still in the classroom, Senor Woolley was uh, much more limited than he was now, but even still, like I loved using his, um, just the music videos. And so, you know, that would be another thing that um, there's so many teachers that use Somos and Woolley together. Um, but you don't need any of those things. If you have the, if you have this curriculum, it will take you through the whole year. You will have more than enough to fill the whole year. You don't need to, um, also go out and get anything else. You can, there's great things out there that I love, but you don't have to. 
Um, okay, so SOMOS, again, um, before we actually show you the structure of the unit, um, uh, it's comprehension-based and then it's also rich in culture. Um, and uh, this was one of the reasons that I brought this in was when I, um, I had gone from teaching um, like two to 400 level university courses um, that were very culture focused. And then I came down to middle school and it was like teach the days of the week and the months of the year and the colors. And um, it made me want to poke my eyes out. And I felt like I was uh, not having any opportunity to open up all of these conversations that, you know, help students to go out and change the world. And um, I didn't know how to do that um, with a beginning language class until I learned about comprehensible input and I learned how to make things comprehensible. And so when I learned that you can make anything comprehensible, then I wanted to bring that culture back in because language is inextricably linked to culture. Um, I, I feel like they, they have to go hand in hand. And what, you know, I saw in the textbook that I was working from was like language, 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 language. And then at the end of the chapter, it was like a two page spread of panorama, cultura, and like that was the extent of the culture which it just seemed so disappointing to me and usually um, it was in English yes right? and usually in English yeah so it's so it was like completely separate it's like you have culture you can study culture or you can study language but you can't do them both and that's so not true and so sorry I have um my one of my sons has uh Lyme disease and so I've got to remember to be giving him his antibiotics oh. which I'll keep snoozing it. I hate ticks. We're having so many tick problems this summer. Um, okay, so but that's aside, beside the point. So, um, so yeah, when input is comprehended, any content can be co a conduit for language acquisition. And so for me, I really wanted to make culture the focus. The other big one, like Alicia and I have said several times here today, and that we really focused on last week in the mindset shift was, um, you know, that content being students' lives and the connections to them. So when you, when input is comprehended, anything can be content in a language class. Um, and, you know, culture, it opens eyes and it inspires intrigue. I think, you know, so many of us became language teachers because we were intrigued or enamored by um, the culture of the language that we were studying or because we were traveling and, um, you know, one thing led to another and here we are teaching the language. Um, and so that's what I want, um, want for my students, too. So in SOMOS, the culture um, connects um, co core vocabulary to a cultural product perspective or practice. So um, you use core vocabulary in storytelling, and then you use that same vocabulary to learn about something cultural. Um, usually it starts out as text-based, so there's some kind of a reading that um, exposes uh, that gives students like an overview of this product practice or perspective. Um, and then uh, to, I think it was Hannah had the question, um, mm -hmm. um, Hannah's question. And then it scaffolds uh, level appropriate authentic resources for novel lear novice learners. So it starts out with kind of an, uh, an overview um, and then we bring in authentic resources. And really because SOMOS is only available for levels one and level two, um, all these cultural pieces are really meant to start conversations. Um, you know, we can't go, it, it, students don't have the language to be able to go super in depth into a lot of cultural topics. And that's okay. I think that, um, you know, we want to, uh, break stereotypes. We want to, uh, uh, um, yeah, just start the conversations uh, about these topics that students are maybe vaguely familiar with. And so, um, you know, we can do that by presenting two sides the, of, uh, of an issue or presenting multiple perspectives um, through input. But then when it gets into like the really digging into it and discussing it, um, those conversations are things that can happen outside of class time um, in English if they need to. But but we want to start conversations that care, students are going to be carrying over into um, their lives outside of Spanish class. And I, I want to point out that we're teaching novice learners, which mm -hmm. means children's books are really challenging for them. They're not going to. So that would be like a classical authentic resource um, that some people would consider to be age and, and level appropriate, but we know that children's books are actually really hard and we want to make sure that our kids are attending at that, 
or our understanding at that 98% comprehended level. So I think um, one of the pieces that SOMOS does really well is that it connects the core vocabulary to the cultural piece, the product perspective or practice, um, but it does it in a way that is really accessible rather than inaccessible and incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. And I think that as a teacher, that's one of those things that we really have to balance because we have really strong opinions about a lot of these um, cultural topics. And so we want to go in like really, really deep and, and, and keep things, but our students just don't have the language for that as novices. And so it doesn't mean that you can't do those things, um, but it, that's one of those things that you have to, you know, we have to think about, you know, what's the balance that we want to use in our classes between that really deep cultural exploration um, and language use. Like, is it okay to, you know, say for one class period, we're gonna spend 20 minutes talking in English. Um, you know, that's a decision that you have to make for yourself. Or is it okay to just present overviews and then kind of let these thoughts marinate in our students' brains? Is it okay if I just, you know, um, uh, scratch the surface of this topic and then walk away from it. Um, and so those are all of the kinds of ways, things that you have to think about as you're um, walk, looking at the lesson plans and saying like, okay, you know, am I comfortable bringing this up if we can't really get into it? Or, you know, should I spend some, should I leave some time in my lesson to talk about this in English? Um, and so those are all uh, decisions that you can make and everyone's going to arrive at um, different decisions. Okay, so finally, this is what we're talking about today the structure of a, a SOMOS unit. Um, so we have a three, this is every SOMOS, most every SOMOS unit, and this, this is really for SOMOS 1. SOMOS 2 does look a little bit different. I, sh I should have, I, it's just occurring to me now that I didn't really talk about that. Um, in, in SOMOS 2, there's not a cultural topic for every, um, for every unit. Um, so always for SOMOS 1 and sometimes for SOMOS 2. Um, the unit begins by just enjoying stories. So you're going to start out like the day one, you're going to establish meaning for the new core vocabulary. You're going to say, hey, this is what these words mean in English. If your students have um, a common English as a common first language, this is what they mean. And then you start doing stories. And so stories could mean TPRS. It could mean movie talk. It could mean a story told through a song. Um, it could mean the personalized question and answer. So the stories of your students' lives, um, stories from their lives. But that is what that first phase is focused on. Do you want to jump in about anything about that? Um, the introduction of the core vocabulary is really important. So however you choose to interact with these story options, whether it's modified movie talk or a song or a TPRS story, um, that step of introducing the core vocabulary and establishing meaning is really important to have success through the next two pieces. So keep that in mind as you're looking at your own planning process. Don't skip that step um, if you want the most success. That's what keep, helps keep it comprehended. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and then, uh, and then moving from that to the introduction of the cultural topics. So the stories, like you'll tell a story, you'll watch a movie and, and talk through the movie, um, and you'll spend a couple days doing that. And then you'll usually do some activities based on that. So to just kind of keep, uh, recycling the story and, um, you know, students typically they like, especially if it's a story you've created together, they like revisiting it and talking about the story because it's something fun. It's theirs. It's their baby that they've created. And, you you know, even with a movie talk um, where it's something that a story is that's told to them, um, you know, in my experience, my students really like the repeated exposure to that story through um, that happens through uh, well cho chosen activities um, so that they have the confidence to be able to retell it. They like talking about um, talking about things and being able to talk about things in the target language. So that story phase lasts I mean, it could last anywhere from three days to two weeks. <laughs> um, you know, usually in the lesson plans, it's written as between three and four days for that first phase. But like Alicia said, a lot of teachers take a lot longer with it. Um, and that is okay. And then you'll introduce the topic to your students. So you take the same core vocabulary that um, you uh, 
that was focused on in the stories and you use that same set of vocabulary to introduce a topic to your students. So uh, as Alicia said, a product, a practice, or a perspective. Um, and usually it's just a short couple paragraph reading um, presenting a topic to um, students. And from there, that's when you bring in the authentic resources and um, other activities to um, ex to learn more about the topic. So a lot of um, there's a lot of videos that we use from YouTube, um, some uh, infographics, songs. Um, so one piece uh, to go back to Hannah's question about appropriate scaffolded authentic resources. A <laughs> A concrete example is in unit two, the target structures are runs, walks, and is at like time. Um, runs, so, walks, so sees. Runs, walks, sees, sorry. Um, see, I can't even do it without using the TBR gestures. I, 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 I just can't. Um, I can't speak Spanish without my hands. <laughs> um, so then the introduction of the topic is a picture of the uh, Corrida del Toros, or no, the Enciero del Toros, mm -hmm. and um, that uses runs, walks, and sees. So, and then there's a short reading. And that, so that's a, a very concrete of moving from the core vocabulary to an authentic picture, which is a cultural product, right? And then moving into the exploration, do you wanna talk about an exploration, what the explorer means? Yeah, so um, so that's your opportunity um, to uh, really see. I, I, I know we were just talking about Encierro de Toros, but the, the Corrida de Toros, for example, you know, the reading kind of presents two perspectives on it, but very briefly, you know, it says, you know, some people say this is a cultural tradition. Other people say that it's animal cruelty and torture. And so then in the cultural exploration, like that was just a very brief, like, okay, this is what this is what a Corrido de Toro says. These are two perspectives on it. And so then in the exploration, then um, you get to learn a little bit more about like, what is a bullfight? And if you feel comfortable showing a part of a bullfight, there are suggestions for um, some videos that you can show your students. A lot of teachers don't feel comfortable even showing up a, a piece of a bullfight bull um, and that's okay. Um, and then there's uh, for perspectives, then we look at, um, you know, okay, so there's people out there that say that this is an art form and it's culture. And so we look at, you know, what are the, what are they using to defend that? How, how could someone consider a bullfight as a form of culture? And so we look at, you know, the, the, um, the uh, different, like the moves that the, the toreros use and how there's traditions behind those. And then we look at, okay, well then other people say it's torture. So then we look at um, the some of the protests and some of the changes in legislation that have been happening. Um, and, you know, we do that all with authentic resources, but always scaffolded. So, you know, if you're showing students a, a video, um, there's suggestions for how to talk through that video with them at the language um, that matches the level of that SOMOS unit. If you are um, looking at a picture of a protest, what are some things that you as the teacher can say about that that your students will probably understand? And then again, it's on you to make sure that they're actually understanding what they what they probably could understand. Um, and then uh, what was the other thing I was going to say about that? I don't remember. I don't remember. You presenting alternate perspectives. Oh yes, yeah. So um, and that's that's a a, a big thing for me, and, and it, I think it is so hard uh, with novice students to um, move past the stereotypical phase, and that is something that I've tried so hard to do in the SOMOS curriculum. That um that um you know, presenting those multiple perspectives and then digging into each of them just a little bit and allowing students to arrive at their own conclusions. Um, and I think that that is a really, really hard thing to do as a teacher um, because we have strong opinions on a lot of things, um, a lot of really important things. And, um, you know, uh, I guess the nature of, of most opinions is that uh, we think it's right. <laughs> And so we want other people to have the same opinion, but you know, that's not, um, that's not our, that's not our job. So the, what we can do is, um, is present things as, uh, as, 
uh, fairly unbiased in such an in, in, in as unbiased a manner as possible, and then be okay with students arriving at their um, at their own conclusions. And setting, creating a culture where listening to each other and accepting of different points of view is so important. Um, mm -hmm. Because isn't that civil discourse something that yes. we are all striving for as we're engaged in teaching humans, not just subject matter? Mm -hmm. um, I know for me, that's such a huge focus in my class is mm -hmm. teaching kids how to listen and communicate. It happens to be in the target language, but that civil discourse, if we disagree, yes. that's okay. Let's mm -hmm. just be kind about it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what hard. A great thing to, it's so hard, but what an amazing yeah. thing to model for the kids it, it and is. to teach. Yeah, it is. And then also, I think another thing to, to that uh, is really important for teachers to develop is to know when to call a conversation quits. <laughs> so, um, you know, there is a time to keep pushing, even though it's hard and trying to understand. And then there's other also times to walk away from conversations. And if you are curious about what this actually looks like for different teachers, um, there have been a lot of teachers who've really posted about their vulnerability on mm -hmm. our Somos Facebook group yes. page. And I appreciate that so much, ways that they've had difficult conversations, ways that they've maybe uh, not successfully had difficult conversations and yeah. reflected upon it. So I encourage you to use that search bar to look for those things if you're curious, because there's a lot of collective wisdom in this group. And I'm so appreciative of every time somebody talks about that sort of thing, because yeah. that's how we all learn and grow. Yeah. And I, um, I want to plug, um, Rochelle and, uh, Anna. Oh my gosh, right. <laughs> yes. Rochelle and Anna. Um, uh, they're, uh, why can't I, I can't even think of the name of it. Elevate right now. Education Consulting. Thank you. Elevate and Educational Consulting. So if any of you, if that is really a passion of yours um, to dig into that kind of thing, um, to learn how can you facilitate those conversations? How can you, um, you know, create a culture in your class that is um, open and accepting? Um, elevate Educational Consulting. Um, I would strongly recommend uh, joining their uh, uh, I wouldn't say cohort, but it's a, uh, it's a cohort model professional development. Yeah. And yeah. they've had such a, a deep impact on my own practice in terms of creating an inclusive classroom and respecting culture and really mm -hmm. learning how to teach culture through the mode of SOMOS, but then finding my way through it. Um, highly, highly recommended. And I'll post the, uh, link as soon as I find it. Mm -hmm. Um, so one question that uh, someone asked, and I can't say the name, so I apologize. They said, in many middle school, students only have class every two or three days. What modifications should be made? That's a question that comes up a lot. Um, and so I guess I'll start with the extreme, which is teachers say, oh, I only see students once a week. Um, you know, is almost a good fit. And I honestly would say probably not if you're only seeing your students um, once a week. Um, there just is so much in the curriculum. It would take you so long to move through things. Um, and so I think for classes that meet once a week, um, it's a better fit to just focus on things like special person interviews um, and not bringing in quite so much of the culture um, because you're just not going to make progress um, with the language as much. Um, in classes, schools where you have class every two or three days, um, I would just say to really look at those unit overviews and consider like what things are. Um, uh, the most essential and what things are more fluff and you can cut out the fluff. You're probably going to end up cutting out um, some of the uh, cultural exploration. Like you might be, um, be okay with just introducing the topic and then maybe do one or two of the suggested, suggested cultural activities, but not as many. Um, you might uh, not do a song for every unit um, especially because if students aren't seeing you every day, you know, they'll be okay going longer with a song like carrying it over from the last unit. So I would just try to trim things out if you're only seeing students every couple days. What what would you add to that? Um so I'm next year I'm embarking on a whole new phase in teaching elementary school and I'm helping uh create the curriculum for a third through fifth grade class that I will be teaching one of the sections of fifth grade. And um it is 
I, I'm not going to use Somos for a bunch of reasons. One of them is that I only see them for 45 minutes a week and not mm-hmm. every week at that. It'll be most weeks, but not every week. So I'm doing a lot of special person. I'm planning on backwards planning from a novel if I have the funds. But mm-hmm. um, and then a lot of pieces from the storyteller's corner, mm-hmm. uh, which is a great elementary curriculum. Yeah, the story. Uh, yeah. And that's another question that comes up a lot. So mm-hmm. I'll plug that. I, I do not recommend using Somos with anyone really younger than sixth grade, but maybe you can stretch it to fifth grade with some modifications. But on, under that, I would not use Somos. The Storyteller's Corner has some great resources. Um, El Mundo de Pepita has great resources. Mm-hmm. And then Mrs. Spanish's class, um, Anne Marie Mitchell, she uses Somos in her upper level, um, in her older classes. And so I think that she has a very Somos feel to her units. Um, and hers is, yeah, it's uh, Mrs. Spanish class. And I forget what the curriculum is called, but you can look that up on Teachers Pay Teachers. Okay, so I just wanted to come back to this to say that comprehensible input is the one thing. So if the focus always needs to be on comprehension, so no matter what you do, no matter what modifications you make to the curriculum, um, in order for it to maintain the same efficacy, um, you need to keep the focus on comprehension. So um, I know we all wanna get them talking, get them talking, get them talking. Um, That's exciting, it's glamorous, um, but that's not where the bulk of language acquisition happens. It's in the comprehension. Next week, we're going to be talking about assessment, July 2nd, 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, uh, So hopefully we'll see you there. But we do have a few minutes. Um, I have a few minutes. Uh, My computer's at 5%. I can find a plug if you guys have any questions. Um, And if not, um, if you're catching the replay, uh, we can answer questions um, then, too. We've been following up on them. Special person interviews, yes. I think special person interviews are so awesome. I didn't really know about them when I was in the classroom. I've only um, learned about them and started using them um, in uh, like special classes that I teach every now and again uh, since then. But they are a wonderful thing um, to build into your curriculum if you're ready for it. I have to say I was not ready for it the first three years that I tried them. And... Mm -hmm. um, so I think the second year I embarked on so most I tried to use them. It was a total failure. Third year, it was less of a failure, but still not great. Fourth year, it was, eh, it wasn't my thing. It didn't work. This year, I really, I didn't even commit, but I said, I'm going to try it again. And it mm-hmm. was radically different. And it turned mm-hmm. out to be one of the best things I did for my classroom community and myself. Um, and I so recommend it. but. I think the piece that's important is not that they're so great, is that it takes you a long time to figure out what works. And it's okay if you have a total flop. Um, And then do something else the next day or come back to it. It's okay. I'm so glad that you shared that because I think that, um, you know, in in my experience too, like I try things even a couple times and I'm like, ugh. That's just that's not going to work for me. But sometimes it takes a lot of tries before Mm -hmm. you um, before you find your um, sweet spot um, with an activity. And so it doesn't mean that the activity is not for you. Maybe it does. Um, um, Maybe it does mean that it's not a good fit, but maybe it's just that you need to, you know, keep chiseling away at it. And until you find, um, you know, that magic, you can you can make that magic. So so it's okay to fail. Let me address. Before we go on to the other questions, Catherine asked me what failed about special person. It was boring. The kids were (laughs) bored by it. I didn't know how to ask questions yet such, I didn't know how to scaffold the question and answer process. And I think I was starting it too early. I know there are some teachers who start it right at the beginning and highly scaffold it, but that didn't work for me. I had to wait until my kids had a fairly a robust body of language before we could really embark upon it and still scaffold it heavily. And then, and the other piece that I think that I didn't have was this real culture of listening and communicating and inviting people to share and that culture of respect. So I think I had to build both of those pieces um, in order for it to be successful. Crystal said, is special person from the super seven unit? Um, So special person. 
No. Um, so that I'm not sure that's not, um, that's not my um, unit. Um, super seven or a super special person um, started out as star of the day. I believe Jody Noble was the mastermind um, behind it. Bryce Hedstrom has the most extensive resources about special person interviews. Um, and I highly recommend just going to his website and typing in special person interview. You'll find all sorts of tutorials um, in there. And then I do have a slideshow um, that will support you in doing special person interviews, although it doesn't really have um, tutorials um, because, like I said, Bryce has the best ones out there for that. So um, if you choose to do that, um, Bryce Hedstrom, you can get the slideshows from the Comprehensible Classroom, but, um, but definitely walk through Bryce's tutorials. I'm going to call it. I'm going to call this meeting of the Summer Somos Fun Club to an end. Um, but uh, next week we'll be talking about assessment and then we will be archiving that question about embedded reading because um, I thought that is definitely an important one that um, that is a hang up for a lot of people. Thank you guys Thank so you. much. We're so Until happy next week. Bye. Have a, have a great week.